Hey wine snobs, welcome to another episode of Wine Snob TV. Today we're off the beaten path at Amador Cellars in Plymouth, California. I've been wanting to visit this winery for quite a while now and uh, I don't know what took me so long, but today we're doing a little behind the scenes with winemaker Michael and we're going to be exploring some of their really fantastic wines that they put out here. All artisan, small batch production wines and uh, we're also going to be taking a look at the grounds today. So, come with me behind the scenes, off the beaten path. So this is a this is about as busy as uh, harvest gets. So we have um, a bunch of stuff fermenting, more stuff coming in Monday, Tuesday. Um, I have three tanks in here that are all full. All my tanks in the other building are full. So we'll uh, we'll kind of uh, check out what we have and um, talk uh. about some of the wines we're making. Yeah. So this uh, we have four bins of uh, Barbera from Carmera right here. Um. We get three different lots of Barbera, um, each vintage. So Fields Family is where we get a majority of our Barbera from. They have the Cooper clone. They have uh, also an Italian clone uh, 19, which is dark, pigmented, spicy. Um, the Cooper clone is gonna be a little more herbal, a little more red, red and blue fruit. Um, but these I actually, so this year is kind of interesting because I've, uh, been doing a natively fermented Zinfandel yeah. since 2013 was my first vintage and um, ha have had a lot of success with it and this year there's I've I've actually done a bunch of stuff native because it's just producing some beautiful wine and yeah. so I'm, I'm running with it um, so this Barbera right here is going with uh, being fermented with native yeast right now yeah I was uh, I was here about two weeks ago and uh, I really I really love your work man it was really nice to it's very, very crisp, very clear, nicely well-built, executed wines. Cool. Um, Thank you. I was really, I was, I was, I understand why a lot of people kept telling me you have to go down. Oh, cool. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm glad you got how, that how recommendation. Uh, so, so my mom and dad are the owners. I, I took over. Uh, my my dad was our original winemaker. Yeah. yeah. Um, I took over for him in 2013, 2014. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I went to Fresno State's winemaking program and nice. uh, tried yeah, to... Yeah, the Grenache is uh, one of my favorite wines. Um, I think it's, to me, it's one of the more underrated varietals in this region. I think you can produce some extremely aromatic, bright, textured Grenaches. And I choose to age it all in, in all neutral oak barrels. So it helps soften and round the, the tannins a little bit, but it doesn't lend any oak flavor because I... Grenache to me doesn't need oak, and I don't like it with oak. And so you were seeing a really kind of pure expression. Um, and so, but it was a 2015 vintage. So that's the thing is we have to give it more time in the bottle to mature and soften so that it's more, uh, so people enjoy yes. it more. Because yeah. yeah. if we were to roll out our 18 Grenache like that, it would be a little rough for people. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. it'd be unapproachable. Exactly, right? yeah. but like a lot of you know, if you go to some of the neighbors' places, the the youngest red on the list is often Grenache because yeah. of the style it's made in. It's just a style I choose to to not make it in. Well, I really like it because you know one of the things that stood out the most in that wine of the whole line. I mean, they're all fantastic wines. Um, was just how that the terroir was expressed. Oh yeah. And for me, I mean, it's not for everybody, but for me, I love that. Oh, absolutely. I love it when I can pick up the essence of the vineyard and the terroir and the wines. You know, for me, it's a really good mark that I always look for. Oh, definitely. Um, and yeah, I really appreciate that approach. You know, that patience, taking time, letting the wine develop, you know. Well, yeah. and, and that's something that's pretty common with us is we like producing wines with authenticity. We don't, you know, we're, we're believers in adding and taking away as little as possible in the winemaking process. So, um, 
like I was saying, we're doing a lot of uh, native uh, native ferments this year, which is meaning not adding commercial yeast, just relying on the, the, the natural yeast found in the atmosphere yeah. within the winery grounds uh, to do the fermentation. So why, why I like native is you get this kind of slow, uh, slower fermentation, little cooler, a little more drawn out, uh, some really neat kind of um, complexities that you get. Yeah. And it just, so yeah, as long as you can, can make a, have a clean fermentation natively, it's the way to go. So isn't so. that kind of gutsy? You know, because you go through this whole process of actually growing your crop <laughs> and, you know, that's a whole different journey in itself. And you finally get to harvest and you harvest all these grapes and you, yeah. there's, there's a hint of, yeah. isn't there, there's an element of chance. In there that. is, there I mean, is. And the reason I've kind of rolled with a lot of native fermentations this year is because I've had a lot of success. Um, like I was saying, the native Zin, we've had success on each year. And then I've tried like a bin of Grenache native, a bin of Tempranillo native, a bin of this native. And I've learned each time what worked and what didn't work. And this year I'm, I'm really kind of learning, you know, uh, some things that, that are working for us. Using some dry ice is helpful. Um, it, it helps kind of eliminate some of the oxygen within the must and lower, lower the oxygen content. Um, so you're not having to worry as much about the aerobic microbes, which are what yes. you're worried about is right. developing vinegar, developing ethyl acetate. Yeah. So, um, but we're having some beautiful fermentations this year and, um, yeah, we can walk around yeah, and punch good. some of the, this is our original building. Um, this was the only building here from 2004 through 2017 yeah. and we outgrew it. Um, so we built this additional barrel building that we're gonna walk into here on the left. Um, and sorry for the mess, we got barrels and bins <laughs> everywhere. We're it's hydrating, I know. <laughs> it's hi it's, uh, we're hydrating barrels, this getting ready for, thing. yeah, new, uh, new patio area um, that kind of connects the two buildings together. And yeah, beautiful. My mom and dad have done a wonderful job on it. So yeah. my brother built these doors really neat neat doors wow, look at those hinges i know had them custom built so that's crazy yeah it's pretty cool that's awesome so yeah so this is the uh what we call the barrel building so we have um some bin ferments going on in here you can see down the alley and down here yeah um so so we can punch some bins basically so we have uh just to look around the room real quick we have our rosé of Primitivo and Tariga in this tank right here. We have some Fiano in this little tank, some Sauvignon Blanc in this tank. We have, uh, we're custom crushing for the Malone family. They have some Grenache Rosé in here. Oh, nice. We have a uh, start of Vermentino in this tank. Um, and then bin, in bins, we have some Mouved. We have some, I gotta, I gotta see. We've been, uh, I, you know, I recently started discovering it. I love it. I love the, I love the way it expresses itself. Yeah, cool, um, great. This one looks like it's about done, so I'm gonna avoid that. As you can see here, this, uh, the cap or the solids are starting to sink down a little bit, which yep. means there's not a, much CO2 being produced, uh, um, which means that, that it probably doesn't need to be punched, but look at the color on that. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, that Just is rich. Black. Look at that. Yeah. Beautiful, but it's bright gorgeous. too. Yeah. So wow. we'll punch down the next bin since punching down, if you don't have any CO2, there is really no need to punch down. Okay. You're uh, part of the, part of the, part of this process is releasing the CO2 that's trapped beneath. So you got the yeast producing alcohol and CO2 from sugar. Yeah. And so punching down, you're mixing the solids into the wine fermenting below to get more extraction. You're releasing CO2 that's coming up in the form of these bubbles, and uh, you're getting oxygen to the fermenting yeast down below. So that's punching down, that's why nice. you do it. Wow. In a tank, you do something more like a pump over, yep. and you take wine or juice from the bottom and you pump it over the top of the tank. So that's the alternative um, way of doing this. This half, bin, half ton bin fermentation it's pretty popular for smaller wineries. It, it's just a kind of a, it's just a good way to ferment. Yeah. You can use different yeasts and different bins and make a really complex wine. That's the cool thing about 
how your nose and taste works is it is it evokes memories really well. Yeah. And so if you really spend time thinking about what you're tasting and what you're smelling, you know, a lot of times in the future you're going to be like, oh, this smells like that wine at this time, or you do that with foods too. Yeah. So it's kind of cool. Um, we'll taste uh, we'll taste driest to sweetest. Okay. So we'll start with some Sauvignon Blanc here. So 2020 Sauvignon Blanc. So it's supposed to be cloudy. Uh, you know, it doesn't doesn't settle out till it's completely finished. I had a little bit of red in my glass. If you're wondering, mine's a little different color. I know oh, what color wow. it is. The, so the nose on that. It's beautiful, huh? That's amazing. That's yeah. incredible. So, um, where is that? How do you, where is that from? <laughs> so basically, it's this sweet honeysuckle, yeah, uh, peach, peach, tropical, wow. it has some guava. There's, yeah, there's yep. some, um, there's even some pineapple in there. Yeah. So, so basically, I use a yeast that promotes thiol production in the wine, which gives you more of the guava, passion fruit, um, some really pretty floral notes and some greenness as well. That's incredible. Um, so, so this is just about finished. I'm gonna leave it in the tank on the lees and then we'll rack it into stainless steel barrels and leave it on the lees until bottling and then we'll filter it and bottle it. We fil only filter it because it hasn't gone through malolactic yeah. and we're not gonna let it go through malolactic. If you bottle of wine unfiltered that hasn't gone through ML, you could it could restart in the bottle. And yeah. that's not what you're going for on a <laughs> this is commercial incredible. product. This in a, in a bubbly sparkling would be well, mind boggling. Well, why do you think I'm trialing them out? <laughs> wow. So good acidity. Um, and it's not even finished, but this is just the nose alone. That pretty? I would love to see that in a flute. Wow. <laughs> All right, well, one of these days what you make mm -hmm. But you make some out of Primitivo. Wow. Um, I like doing bl rose blends too yeah. because I feel like roses can be a little boring to me. Yeah, you, you get the advantage of the layering of the exactly. different characteristics in there. And so yeah. each time I've made a rose, 18, 19, 20, we've done two to three different grapes pick the same day at varying ripeness to achieve even more wine complexity. Snob. Right, as <laughs> the wine snobs. So. <laughs> yeah, every, all the snobs have been saying, you gotta go to Amador Cellars. You gotta go to Amador Cellars. <laughs> so it's like, finally, after, it took me long enough, sorry. And I, I went, two weeks ago, I apologized to your mom. Did you? For not coming sooner. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Well, you're here, hey, it, it, you're here now. Yeah. And you came back shortly after for a tour, so. Um, so you guys saw punch downs in the other building. These tanks are all full. I have uh, my second, we do a lot of Zinfandel here. So this is my, for lack of a better term, when I bring it in, it's my second Zinfandel batch. So we have uh, the first estate Zin we harvested on 915. It's been about a, a week in this tank fermenting before I transferred the wine to the tank next door. That uh, estate Zin is more red fruit driven with good spice, uh, bright acidity. And then this second batch of Zinfandel, a little riper. Riga, so like um, I said, even says on the back label, uh, native whole berry ferment, light in body and highly aromatic, maybe served slightly chilled. So like 55 is a good temperature. This is just cellar temp right now because we didn't have one in the, um, the fridge. But. So super yeah. aromatic, very yeah. floral, pretty. Yeah, it's very smooth. Because we, we have, yeah. as you know, we have a lot of big, bold, red wine structured. Yes. So made specifically to bottle young. So no crush on this. We destemmed it. Um, whole berry, native ferment. And then um, didn't leave <laughs> yeah, it. So 2012 we, is an amazing year. We yeah. like holding on to some of those really structured wines. And partially because what, my dad's been making wine at home since 1990, but only commercially, commercially since 2004. Yeah. So it's kind of fun to see how certain wines evolve. Yeah. Because like I said, we don't, we're, we're not believers in fining our wines, meaning we don't add anything to yeah. uh, precipitate tannins. We let the natural tannins. Um, to
Mm, I can tell it already. It already is asking to breathe. <laughs> <laughs> but you know how you were picking up, you said black licorice. Yeah. Uh, that's one of the characteristics in the foothills that older wines almost always have is that anise licorice characteristic. It's very meaty. It's got a meaty mouth oh, yeah. feel. Very meaty. Yeah. Yeah, that, that kind of classic Mouved character. Yeah. Boy, it still has a long way ahead of it. Yeah. Not even not even I, close to falling. I don't think apart. it's it's not even crested. It's not even close. Mm -hmm. I mean it's fantastic. Now would be the time to start opening it, but it's almost lamentable. Just yeah. just let it be. It needs to take a nap. Definitely. They age beautifully well. And like I said, we don't mess with our wines. We let them, you know, kind of show their true colors. And so. Roll it, roll it, and while you're rolling, you explain what you're doing. I've never seen that before. Um, <laughs> um, I, I do this to aerate it. So it's kind of like a, a lazy way of swirling. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a good <laughs> way to see it. the color and stuff right. too. And yeah, you can the also edges. look at the color, look yeah. at the legs. Um, and just get a general sense and feel the wine. Um, open it up as fast as possible, maximum surface area. And then also, you know, release those aromas. But Alianico, so this, this is our 15 Alianico. This to me is one of the best wines that I've ever made. So 2015 Alianico, um, grown on our estate. This is, you thought the Mouved was still young at 2012. We haven't released this Alianico. Um, this 2015. That's a nice and uh, it's just beautiful, it's dense, nice caramel, concentrated, on there. aromatic, yep. structured. It's, it's kind of so everything beautiful. you look for in a age-worthy wine. It just has so much character. That's why I love it. Wow, it's very inky. Amador Cellars so accurately embodies the kind of winery I love spending a day exploring. A small, family-owned and operated artisan winery. This is the very frontier of California winemaking. Each bottle nurtured and crafted by the very folks pouring you a taste. If you're lucky, as I was, Linda Long, or Mom as I call her, will be serving your tasting herself. Winemakers are some of the most understated and unassuming people you can meet. They carry around with them a lifetime's worth of knowledge and experience, able to pull from it at any moment. They possess the unique ability to apply very deep technical scientific knowledge and creativity as they rise to the occasion and challenge each vintage brings. Michael Long is a young winemaker with a very mature style. He has many more vintages ahead and I very much look forward to exploring all of them. I enjoyed all the wines and thought they were well built, layered, nuanced and very much representative of the region. My favorite on the tasting menu was the Grenache Noir. My favorite from the library was the Alianico. The most interesting was his unconventional take on the Tariga. And that unfinished sparkling wine is simply incredible. So Amador Cellars has been around for since, I mean, the early 2000s. And uh, obviously one of the earlier wineries in the area. It's all family owned and family operated. Uh, founded by their father and uh, now their son is a winemaker and uh, you can really see how the wines have matured over time and uh, it's been really a treat to come out here and talk with him about some of his philosophies and some of his ideas and winemaking and just his journey overall and how he got to this place so they're doing fantastic work out here at Amador Cellars and uh, it's been really a privilege to come out and take a look and meet the family and uh, just talk about how this small artisan winery has been living their dream. You know, a lot of people, um, this is all they've ever wanted to do. And it's really humbling sometimes to share and to witness that, um, you know, happen. Um, it's in a way it's magic and uh, beautiful I love it this is why we do wine snob TV I want to share this with you 
I want you to see this. Um, it's oftentimes it gets lost in translation when you're doing a wine review and you're doing photos and writing a couple paragraphs and thoughts and tasting notes. But this is really where the magic happens. When you come out here and you meet these amazing people who decided at some point along their journey that they were just going to get up and make their dreams a reality. And it really shows in the wine, the passion, the love for the vine, for the wine, for the terroir, and the endless pursuit of that all elusive perfection. <laughs> You know, the more you journey in wine, you start to realize the more you don't know. And that pretty much summarizes my experience with Wine Snob and consequently Wine Snob TV now. But I'm glad I can bring you with me. I'm glad I can share this with you. And I look forward to many more amazing episodes. So stay tuned. Welcome to Wine Snob TV.